Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Marianne Pastana, and we have two very special guests today. Our first guest today is Kathy Kava, and she's here to share with us her new novel, And Sometimes Why. So welcome to the show, Kathy Kava. Thank you so much, Mary Ann. Nice to be here. Well, it's great to have you here, Kathy. You know, I just have to ask, what inspired you to write this book? Um, To my knowledge, there may have been, but I was not aware of there being any novels or memoirs about the Iranian Revolution. There are lots of uh, novels and stories about, you know, the Holocaust, the French Revolution, um, Russian Revolution. I hadn't seen any such... uh, works from Iranian writers about the Iranian revolution. So that was my quest. It's it's a novel slash memoir uh, about the Iranian revolution. That was my main goal at the beginning. So you took a lot of inspiration from your own experience? Yes, that is true. That's that's a question I get asked a lot. Is it a memoir? Is it a novel? Uh, so as a, as a book publicist, you know that for a book to be qualified as a memoir, it really has to be very, very similar to the writer's um, life. Even the dialogue has to not verbatim, but it has to be very close to the actual dialogue. So that's not the case with my book. The events uh, obviously are true, the historical events, the political events. The main character is based on me. There are a lot of themes that are based on my real life, but <clears throat> the other characters and the storyline is, is fiction. So I had to categorize it as fiction. So why don't you take us back to 1979 in Iran? What was that like? Well, I was, in the book, the main character is eight. I was actually seven uh, when the revolution happened. So I was in Iran, and I have a good memory. So I actually remember what life, well, for me, for a child was during, you know, before the revolution. So I remember going to an American school. I had a lot of American friends, American teachers. I actually spoke better English than I did Farsi. Uh, When the revolution happened, I just remember there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of people left Iran. My parents wanted to leave, but they were kind of hesitant. I this this is actually in my book. Uh, my parents told me not to say the word Shah anymore. They told me not to say anything bad about Khomeini. I was very confused. I was not politically savvy. I just remember there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of hush hush going on. And then when the hostage taking um, happened, uh, they closed down the American school. So I didn't have a school. All the my American teachers, American friends all left. Again, I wasn't really aware of what was going on, but I knew that it, it was just a lot of chaos. I changed a lot of schools. Um, my parents were just whispering all the time. There were death threats against my, my and my brother's life for money. I mean, just a lot of political and social upheaval. So um, that's that's really what I remember from the onset of it. That is just, you know, remarkable to hear all of that, because I think a lot of people, when they think about going to school, especially in the U.S., they don't consider what, you know, what some people go through in other countries just to be able to have an education. Absolutely. absolutely. I changed about four schools in, in five years, and it was a transition to go from American school to an Iranian public school and having to wear, you know, the, the Islamic uh, hijab, as you call it, you know, cover our heads and our bodies. And we had to pray during school hours. We had to study the Quran. And then when the war happened, obviously there was bombing. I mean, I remember going, you know, hiding in the basement. The, it was, yeah, it was a definitely a difficult time. Well, it's just, it's heartbreaking to hear that, you know, because there's so many people there just, you know, that don't understand what's happening and get into the politics. And even today, we have so many young people that just don't understand, you know, that time in history. Absolutely. I was uh, talking to another um, interviewer. My my own son is 17. He's a first generation American. So uh, my ex-husband and I, you know, we were both born in Iran, came here during our youth. My son is a first generation American. And obviously he knows the basics of it, but he has no idea how um, I'm not even comparing what I went through to what's going on in Afghanistan with the women. But 
you know, when, when I see the images of what's happening in Afghanistan, it's, it kind of hits very close to home. And, you know, my son looks at it as if these are just images on the news when it's, when it's personal, when it's happened to you, when you know what's going on, it's, it's definitely, um, it definitely hits much closer to home. So yes, even the young people, even the Iranian generation, this new generation is not really aware of what we went through. Yeah. It's just heartbreaking to watch that, you know, and I think, I mean, you don't have a heart if you you don't emotionally connect to what's happening and just Absolutely, wish yeah. there was something that we can do, you know? Absolutely. Mm. Well, I know you talk about immigrating to Los Angeles. Was that just where you guys went or did you have choices? We had choices, actually, for my family. It's interesting. We thought of uh, a couple of places we could have gone to. One of them was London. One of them was Germany. And actually, when we left Iran, we were in Germany for about eight months to get our American visas. And my dad, my dad, who's a physician, he had actually studied in, in, in Germany. He had gone through his internship residency, and they offered him a very reputable job um, as the head of the OBGYN department in Frankfurt. But ultimately, they decided to move to Los Angeles, one, because there was a large Iranian community already. They had a lot of friends here. But and this is also in my book. I didn't specify it uh, as much as I'm about to, but I distinctly remember my dad saying this to me. I had no problems living in London or Germany. You know, I was, we were in such limbo that I just wanted to settle somewhere. And I asked my dad, I said, why can't we just live in uh, Germany? And having grown up there, and my mom also went to high school there, they said that um, there's a lot of racism in Germany and that they don't want their kids exposed to that. They said, you know, in the United States, everyone is welcome. Everyone, they consider everyone one of their own. You'll never be treated like a foreigner, which, of course, wasn't my experience. There was a lot of prejudice against Iranians. And um, I was bullied very much for being an Iranian. So I didn't say anything to my parents, but it was kind of ironic. But my dad said, you know, there's no prejudice in America. They accept you as their own. And that was the opposite of the experience I had when I first came here. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that was your experience. And, you know, a lot of times I think to myself, my goodness, why do people have to be that way? I mean, we're all human. Also, it was kids. I mean, uh, none of the teachers, none of the adults. It was mostly kids. And I was young. I was 11 years old. I had never experienced prejudice before. And it was just kids just being kids. But I I took it very personally because I hadn't ever experienced anything like that. Looking back, I don't have any hard feelings. I understand they were just kids. But yeah, I was very confused. I said, you know, what is where I come from or where I was born, as far as politics are concerned, what does the hostage crisis have to do with me personally? So again, and I didn't articulate myself as a child. I didn't communicate with my parents, teachers. So I just took all of this, you know, on and never expressed anything about how confused I was, how, you know, it wasn't fair. And I just sort of went into my own shell. Okay, I'm Iranian. I don't belong. And that just became my reality for a while. Once I went to college, I was a little more obviously grown up, a little more educated, and um, I I was proud of where I was from. I remember taking um, uh, a lot of poetry classes for my um, English literature major, and we did a lot of... uh, writing in the style of Rumi and Hafez and all of a sudden being Iranian was considered a good thing you know all of a sudden Iranians were advancing in the United States and I got to see that instead of being in my own bubble of oh I'm just an outsider in this high school all of a sudden I I got to see what Iranians were really about I stopped being ashamed of being Iranian and being proud of it and that's when I really felt like I was born in Iran and I was proud of that but America is my home and I'm proud of that as well. So that's, that's really when I kind of combined my two nationalities and became proud and of both of them. So like the main character in your book, Miriam, you know, it talks about how she, you know, pretty much raised her brothers. Did that happen to you? No, I actually didn't have two younger brothers. So as I said, uh, Miriam, the character is based on me, but all the other characters are a fiction based. I mean, I did have a mother and father, but they're not the same as the ones in the book. But I didn't have two younger brothers. I did have an older brother. So there is a bit of a similarity there in that my parents had to, <clears throat> excuse me, had to go back to Iran. Their properties were going to get confiscated. They thought that we had ran away. So they even said that they're going 
going to threaten to put my mom in jail because, you know, we, <clears throat> we had ran away, which wasn't the case. So they had to go back and prove that they had nothing to do with the government that to get their properties back. So uh, my older brother and I sort of um, were just by ourselves, you know, so I, this started when I was 13 and he was 16. So they would, uh, my parents would be in Iran half the year, come, come here half the year. And somewhere towards the end of high school, we were pretty much by ourselves the whole year and they would come during the summer. So I didn't really raise anybody, but there was a lot of times there was no one there to raise me either. Let's put it that way. (laughs) (laughs) And it seems that, you know, that, that probably be really difficult for a young person. You know, initially they're like, Hey, this is great. No parents. And then later on, you're kind of like, Oh, I need some help. (laughs) Yeah, no. And they were also very strict. They were very strict. So there was, there was no notion of, Oh, there are no parents around. Let's just have parties. I mean, I was just expected to do well in school, not to party, be home. So it was, it was a very difficult time in my life. You know, between what I was going through in school and not having my parents here, um, it was it was a very difficult time in my life. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine. I mean, being in a foreign country, you're learning a new language. I mean, there's got to be so much. Yeah, a lot, know, of it, yeah. a lot of things all at once. Yeah. But were there some customs that were a little bit more difficult than others for you to kind of get used to? Um. No, I I wouldn't say that because again, like I said, I had gone until third grade. I did go to an American school in Iran. I had to change American schools because they kept closing one. And then another one was an option until third grade, uh, 1981, which everything was closed. So I was very, I did speak English. I was very familiar with the American culture. So there was no, there was no, aside from the prejudice, there was no real culture shock in America. That's, that's one aspect that I did not struggle with. There were no customs or anything that was foreign to me or difficult to adjust to in that, in that regard. What made you decide to go into journalism? Um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there are two things. One is I, I always had a passion for writing. I loved writing. So I definitely wanted to become a writer. But uh, even at that age, I knew that that's not, uh, I always thought of starving artists and everyone said that's, that's not something, that's something you do as a hobby. You don't do that for a living, but I definitely wanted to pursue it. So I studied English literature and did a lot of writing on the side, but, um, I picked journalism as a kind of a backup in case the writing didn't work. And I, I, um, emphasize print journalism because I wanted to write. But while I was in school, I realized that, you know, writing journalism is very different from, you know, fiction writing or other kinds of writing. I didn't like a journalistic writing. It had a very formulaic, very, a lot of rules, uh, not much room for creativity. But I did have that passion for being where the action was, wanting to interview people, wanting to find out more about events and people. So I didn't like the writing aspect. I never wanted to get into broadcast, but I did like, I was very curious. I wanted to know about, you know, events, people. So that part of journalism I love, but I also love writing. So that's sort of how I picked my uh, double major. Your book was such an intriguing read. Do you feel like in writing this, you're encouraging other Iranian authors to share their story or to write a story? I hope so. But it's interesting. Someone messaged me on LinkedIn a while ago. I I didn't even realize this. She said that she's read every book, whether historical, political, fiction by Iranian Americans, uh, European Iranians. And she said that this is the only book that she has read that's from the perspective of a child who remembers the Shah's time in Iran, remembers the revolution, the war, emigrated, uh, immigrated to the United States, then went back to Iran as an adult. She she actually mentioned this. I actually had no idea that there was no no other book quite like this. She she's the one who brought that to my attention. But like I said in um, in the foreword of my book, I know there are other books about this subject, but. We're still Iranian Americans or Iranian Europeans. We're still a minority in the literary world. So I absolutely hope that more Iranians write about their experiences, whether as a memoir, fiction, anything. I I definitely think the market is still still doesn't have enough Iranian writers in it. 
Well, we can always use another voice at the table, and I think a lot of people have no idea what it's like in Iran, especially back during that time. And so, it's important to have these discussions. Absolutely, and that's、um, you asked me this earlier. What my、um, original inspiration was, like I said, back then there was not a lot of、uh, stories about this. So, yeah, the images people had of Iran or what they saw on the news—you know, women wearing the black shadows and you know, death to America—and I just wanted to bring to light that no, that's a that's a small minority that are in Iran that are the religious fanatics. That most of the country is not like that. They're actually pro-West. They're actually again. Against the government, I took a lot of political stuff out of my book because my parents were afraid because they still live there. But I did include some of it to say that you know we're not we're not like that at all. We actually love the West. We were a Westernized country before the revolution. We were moving towards being more Westernized, and most of us are intelligent, educated, open-minded. We don't like wearing these、uh, scarves and uniforms, and you know we're just people. We're just people, just like Americans. Or you know, obviously we have our cultural differences, but as far as being you know human and. Empathetic, we are absolutely we are. So I did want to break that、uh, stereotype. When you went back to Iran, was it difficult for you,、um, and just as a woman, to be there?、Um, I think because I had seen what life was like after the revolution, albeit briefly, maybe just for a couple of years, but it wasn't as shocking to me as someone who had never been there. Uh, I was used, I, not used to, but I remember wearing the Islamic uniform, so that didn't bother me. I did work there for.、Uh, He recently passed away. He was actually a CNN journalist,、uh, Mr. Bozorgmer. I, I was his、uh, assistant editor at Iran News, which was an English language daily. There, I remember the the, the one thing that just popped in my head when I went for my interview. I、um, put out my hand to shake his hand, and he he studied at USC as well, so he wasn't Islamic, but he was just following protocol. And he just frowned and he said, "I can't shake your hand, men and women can't shake hands in public." And I, I was kind of. Taken aback, so that's、uh, you know a lot of little things like that. But once I got the job and started working, the only thing that caught my eye working for the newspaper was how many stories we couldn't run and、uh, how much censorship there was. But aside from that, life in Iran, no, it wasn't. It wasn't shocking for me. It was fascinating. If anything, I was just fascinated by how、uh, westernized they are and how against the revolution they are and how. Generous the people were. I actually loved loved being there, and there were so many parties and so many young people, you know, just hip young people partying. So that part shocked me more than you know being out on the street with the people. That wasn't you know that didn't jar me at all. <laughs> well, and I know you touch on you know just kind of that type of lifestyle, maybe partying, addictions, you know, kind of self destructive、yeah. behavior yeah. in your book. Was there A reason that you felt that that needed to be incorporated in there. Absolutely, two reasons. One is I, I wanted to show the duality of life in Iran, and most of the middle to upper class do lead these kind of lives.、Um, There's the life on the, the everyday life on the streets where you do have to cover yourself and adhere by the Islamic laws. Inside, you know, behind closed doors, there's a whole different world going on. There's、uh, alcohol is forbidden in, in Islam. Drugs obviously are illegal, but it's there's so much addiction in the country. All the young people drink black market alcohol. At the time, it was、um, basically was something like rubbing alcohol. Now it's gotten a little bit better, not much, but so my point is that everything that "Quote unquote," Islam says you're not supposed to do was done behind closed doors, and、um, there's no freedom at the time. Again, now it's a little different. There were no restaurants. There still aren't. There are no clubs. So everything was sort of underground parties, if you will. So、um, between the drinking and the drugs, there's 
a lot, a lot, a lot of addiction in Iran, um, both in the middle and upper class and the lower classes. There's rampant, rampant addiction in the country. And I myself am in recovery. So I, I was prone to addiction. I never got into hard drugs, but I did um, have a problem with alcohol and uh, pills. So I definitely wanted that aspect in there to see that all the childhood traumas and all that, that's for me personally, anyway, it, um, it spiraled into an addiction that I had to deal with later on. Well, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that in one form or another. Do you ever go back to visit family and friends? I do go back and visit. I was there about two years ago, right before Corona, because my parents uh, do live there. So I do go and visit them. I still have some friends there. I don't think I would ever want to live there. But you know, for a visit for a month or two, it's, it's not bad for a visit. So what would you like our listeners to take away from your book? Whether or not they've read similar books, I still do hope that my book uh, highlights in a different way, uh, shedding the stereotypes against Iran, against Iranians. There are parts that I'm very honest about the hypocrisy that's going on in Iran uh, with the government, with the people. So I don't want it to just be one slanted view of, oh, Iran is a great place. Don't look down upon it. There's, There's both aspects of it. I do want the stereotypes about you know us riding camels or us being ultra uh, Islamic or terrorism. I do want those stereotypes up, but I do want to also show what uh, the hypocrisy that is going on with the government still is. I do hope that anyone who's struggling with an addiction or knows someone struggling with an addiction to know how it can start, how um, maybe not obvious it is, but how one can spiral down that. And in the book, there's, I don't clarify if Miriam ever recovers from her addictions, but I do hence, I use the number 12 as a motif. It's very subtle, but I always use the number 12, especially with stairs and steps. That's sort of a motif for the 12 steps of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. So that's kind of like my own little motif of saying that she, she does eventually recover. I'm sure there are a lot of people that appreciate you having this nod to Alcoholics Anonymous and being so candid about your own personal journey. And so for those that feel that maybe they have a problem with alcohol or drugs, please check out aa.org for more information and support. You know, Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much, Marianne. It was my pleasure. If you'd like to connect with Kathy, you can at her website and sometimes whynovel.com for more information. Her book's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and select indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, of course, ask for them to order it. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit MomentsWithMarianne.com for more information.